فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم لأن الله سبحانه وتعالى هي سيز وإذا النفوس زوجت and when the souls are paired and when the souls are paired what does it mean when the souls are paired? The Mufassirin, they differed regarding this verse. What does it mean? Zuwijat, souls are paired. What does that mean? How are they paired? There are two views. The first view is Ulhiqa Kullu insanin bishakli. Everybody will be paired with somebody who resembles, with it, resembles him and is like him in deeds and in actions. In other words, يُقْرَنُ بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِ مَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِ The believer will be connected with his believer brother. And the kafir will be connected to his kafir brother. And the Yahudi will be connected with the Yahudi. And the Nasrani with the Nasrani. Every pair. Like. So a Jew will not be with the Nasrani. The Jews here, the Yahudi and the Nasara here, the believers here. Every group with their people. وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ Pairs, Lakin, pairs. Every two people are same in action and in deeds. That's what's going to be, going to be done. This view is attributed to six individuals. Number one, the greatest of them is Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, هُمَرْ رَجُلَانِ يَعْمَلَانِ الْعَمَلِ فَيَدْخُلَانِ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ He said, they are two individuals. They do actions and they will both enter Jannah together. It's two individuals, same action, good, same deeds, they'll be together. And then Umar radiallahu anhu read the ayah, أُحْشُرُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَأَزْوَاجُهُمْ Gather together the oppressors and the wrongdoers, and وَأَزْوَاجُهُمْ Umar radiallahu anhu, what did he say? ضُرَبَاؤُهُمْ Those who are like them, those who are like them. Abdullah ibn Abbas is also the one who said this view. Also, this view is said by Al-Hasan, Al-Mujahid, Al-Qatada, Al-Rabi' ibn Khuthaym, Rahimahumullah. The second view is, the second view, which is, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ is, رُدَّتِ الْأَرْوَاحُ إِلَى الْأَجْسَادِ فَجُعِدَتْ لَهَا زَوْجًا Every soul, Allah will bring back to it, its nafs, its ruh will be brought back to it, and then Allah will make, him, will make for that person a partner, a wife, a spouse. This view is attributed to Ikrimah. It's attributed to him. Sha'bi. Those, those are the two who said it. And this view is weak. The first view, والقول الأول هو الراجح. The first view is correct. And that is the few, view that Ibn Jarir al-Tabari pushed and the Qur'an shows so. And the Qur'an... It shows that meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُدَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيْ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And when the girl who was buried alive is asked, بِأَيْ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ For what sin she was killed? This here is the issue of burying girls alive, which was from the Arab culture back then. What they would do is, if a girl, he was informed that his wife had given birth to a girl, he would bury her alive. And the reason why he would bury her alive is number one, خوف العار. He's scared of the embarrassment that will come from it. The embarrassment that it will entail. What, is, what, what embarrassment is he referring to? He means that the girl, she's easy to bring about embarrassment to the people. In other words, if she goes and commits zina and whatnot, it's embarrassment for the community or for the people. So they don't like, they killed her because of that. The second one is, خشيتا أن يأخذها العدو Fear that the enemies might come and take the women from them. So that's why they used to bury them alive. Some of them would do it for that. And another group would do it, خَشْيَةَ بِإِمْلَاقَ They were scared of feeding them. 
and some of them believed that Annahu lan yamtafi' amil ibnatihi shay. He would never ever benefit from his daughter. What benefit can she bring me? Because you have to see their culture was about fighting, war, battles, captives, and the people who suffered the most in all of that was women. So they didn't want them to have that problem. Boys would fight and bring something. Girls would take. That's the way they looked at it. Islam, on the other hand, and what it said about women and how it honored them will come to inshallah ta'ala. But the question here is, why is it that Allah mentions the issue of وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُؤِلَتَ Amma, what form has Allah used to speak about this concept? Many might read this, might even memorize the surah, but haven't come across the power in which Allah speaks about the issue. Allah here says وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُؤِلَتَ And when the girl who was buried alive, the mawuda is the girl who was buried alive, su'ilat is asked. Pay attention here. Allah is saying that the girl who's buried alive, she's going to be spoken to. Allah is going to ask, say to her, What sin was it that you, and he's standing there. The one who did it, he's standing there. But he's not going to be spoken to. He doesn't deserve to be spoken to. The question is not even directed at him. He won't be asked, why did you kill her? He's going to be there and he's going to listen to make him feel pain. Imagine when somebody talks about you and you're there. It shows that they are not giving you any consideration. And they're not giving you any importance. So he won't be asked. And he won't be spoken to. The woman who's being killed, this young girl who's buried alive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she will be asked. And when the girl who was buried alive is asked for what sin she was killed. There's another qira'ah, another recitation that says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سَأَلَتْ She now, Allah it will never speak to the person who did this. She turns, the other qira'ah tells us, and then the other recitation it tells us, that she turns at the one who killed her, and she asks, what was it that I did that you killed me for? For what sin did you choose to bury me alive and place me in the uh, grave? So this is the sin, and the, uh, now what many people don't really understand is the concept of abortion and taking a person's life. Many people think, is a long gone issue, if you bury a woman alive, that's it. But many people don't know the concept of abortion, it falls under this verse. Killing a child. One of the things that shaitan tries to take on board, and tries to attain, uh, attain from somebody is what? Make them commit zina. Once they've done zina, the woman becomes pregnant from the zina. And then she goes to the NHS, or she goes to the hospital, and she does abortion. What does she do? She does abortion. She's killed a nafs, and she's committed zina. If the first one wasn't bad, she had to add another sin which shaitan told her. And this concept of abortion, we're going to leave it to when we come to Surah Al-Isra and the details pertaining to it. And is it permissible for, for a, a woman who's gone through rape and she's become pregnant from it? What's the hukum shara'i regarding that? What's the evidence for it? And the discussions pertaining to that, I'll leave it there inshaAllah. And the woman whose child is in her womb and the child is 40 days before that. Can she do abortion or can she not? We will leave that for what? And we're going to leave it for there, inshallah. But there is something I want to mention here. Something which is known as al wadul khafi Which is known as the secret way of burying a lion. Bearing a child alive, there's another form, which the Prophet referred to it as what? Al-Wa'dul Khafi. And what is that? It's called quarterous interruption. Quarterous interruption means, in other words, another term for it, a loose term would be withdrawal. It's before the seminal fluid comes from the Iman, he withdraws. And he does not, uh, he does not, uh, 
release the seminal fluid in his spouse, his wife. This is called al uh, al khafi or that courteous interruption is called al-azli and the Prophet referred to it as al-wa'd al-khafi. The evidence for this is the hadith narrated by Imam Muslim in hadith Judama binti Wahbin radiallahu ta'ala anha. She, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the courteous interruption or with, withdrawal. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to her, ذَلِكَ الْوَأْدُ الْخَفِي This is the secret way of burying a life. So here this mas'ala, the scholars, they differed three views. One view of scholars, they said that the quarter's interruption is haram based on this hadith. Another group of scholars, they said it's makruh, dislike. And another group of scholars, they said it's mubah, it's your choice. You want to do it? You can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So we now are going to remove this hadith that said ذَلِكَ الْوَأْدُ الْخَفِي If we stick by the apparent essence of that hadith, this shows us that it's haram. True or false? Does that hadith alone, that the Prophet said this is the secret way of burying a life, that hadith alone makes it haram. So what is it that removed this hadith from being haram to makruh? لِأَنَّ the ظَاهِرَ of the hadith, the apparent essence of the hadith is that it's haram. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, الوعد and الوعد is what وإذا الموجودة سئلت بأي ذنب is a ذنب and a ذنب is a what محرم it's haram so where can we remove it from being haram based on the hadith of جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله تعالى عنهما بخاري المسلم both narrated he said كنا نعزل والقرآن ينزل we would do quarters interruption and withdrawal and the Qur'an would be coming down, meaning we would do it at the time where the Prophet is with us and is aware of what we're doing and the Qur'an is coming down, meaning the Qur'an has not objected and gone against what we're doing. The Qur'an would have corrected us. Meaning. And another word he says, we used to do quarters interruption and the, at the time of the Prophet and the Qur'an would be coming down, meaning we would not be, with, we would not be stopped from it. Also, Bukhari and Muslim both narrated from uh, Hadith Abi Sa'id al Khudri that they asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Am I asabna Sayyid Sabiyan? Fakuna naazilu fi salda Rasulullah." They they had a woman and they asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Ya Rasulullah, we do quarters interruption." Then the Prophet said, "Awa inna kum la taf'aluna." Do you guys really do that? أَوَ إِنَّكُمْ لَتَفْعَلُونَ ذَلِكَ أَوَ إِنَّكُمْ لَتَفْعَلُونَ Three times the Prophet asked. Do you guys really do that? After he said, they said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah, then the Messenger said, مَا مِنْ نَسَمَةٍ كَائِنَةً إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ إِلَّا هِيَ كَائِنَةٌ Whatever Allah has written for it to be, come, that for it to be produced, till the Day of Judgment will come even if you take every precaution there is. Anything you do to stop it or prevent it or not to happen, if Allah writ it and it was meant to, then it would happen. But he didn't say it's haram, stop doing it. So they took from this that it's karaha. Also, the other hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, لَقَدْ هَمَمْتُ أَنْ أَنْهَا عَنِ الْغِيلَةِ فَنَذَرْتُ فِي الرُّومِ وَفَارِسَ فَإِلَا هُمْ يُغِيلُونَ أولادهم فلا يضر أولادهم ذلك شيء ثم سألوه عن العزل فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذلك الوعد الخفي أن عبيد بن في حديث عن المقري سد وإذا الموجودة سئلت. Also سعد بن أبي وقاص he said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم أن رجل جاء إلى رسول الله ما كم to the Prophet he said يا رسول الله إني أعزل عن امرأتي I do عزل I do quarters interruption with my wife then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم لما تفعل ذلك؟ why did you why did you do that؟ فقال الرجل the man said أشفق على ولدها أو على أولادها I'm concerned for her child or the children. فقال رسول الله the prophet then said لو كان ذلك ضارا ضر فارس والروم if that was harmful then he would have harmed the Romans and the Persians. so this hadith also benefits us if the kuffar do something 
And it doesn't go against our religion, but it's a worldly issue. And we realize after investigation that they've done something, they've practiced it, and it has no physical harm, and it doesn't go against our sharia. Shara is it permissible for us to take it from them? Ah, the Prophet said the Romans and the Persians do it. Are you with me? They've tested it, it hasn't harmed them. So he said. But then the Prophet said, In another hadith, the Prophet said uh, to a man who came to him and he told me, Ya Rasulullah, I do quarters interruption. The Prophet then said, Inna dalika lan yamna shay'an aradahullah. This quarters interruption you're doing cannot stop what Allah wants. If Allah wants a child from this, it will come. Then the man, he did what he wanted to do. He kept doing the quarters interruption. And then he came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, she became pregnant. I was doing the quarters interruption. And then the Prophet said, Ana, ana Abdullahi wa Rasuluh. I am a slave of Allah and I am the messenger of Allah. I am the slave of Allah and I am the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa In other words, what I told you was, was, was right. So there became a khilaf even between the Sahabas. Ridwanullah alayhi wa Some of the Sahabas used to see the permissibility of azm. Some saw it was makhroh. Some saw it to be muharram. If we bring all the evidence together, we would easily eliminate that it's being mubah. We're only left whether it's haram or makruh, disliked. And the strongest is that it's disliked. It's disliked that the person will do that. Because the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? Alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Tazawwajul walud al wadud. Marry the woman who loves to have a lot of children and the woman who loves her husband. The woman who makes herself love her, her husband to love her. She's always working on herself to attract her husband. Marry that woman. And marry the woman who loves to have children. Why? Because I, the day of judgment, I'm going to say this is my ummah, the day of judgment. Don't marry a woman after one child. She's like, no, let me have a break for three years. Yeah? I need to rest for a year or two. Yeah. She has to have it every year. Like, 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 yeah. Sah, brothers. Ah, every year, like child after child. Yeah, Somalis are very good at that. When we came to the UK, we changed. Ah. But having a child. But if the person chooses to take a gap between the children, jazat, it's permissible. It's not haram. They can do it. But is it liked? No, it's makru. It's disliked. But they can do that. They can take a break. And they can take it. Uh, take a period of time between the two. Whether that contracep contraception is the withdrawal method that they do, or whether they take other medication, it is permissible بشارطة, with the condition of what? That it doesn't harm. If the medication makes her not have children anymore, and it will cause her medical harm, then she shouldn't take it. She should not take it. If it's not going to cause her any harm, then it's permissible, then it's permissible for her. Burying girls alive or killing them is something great in our religion. It's from the major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he added it next to zina and killing. He says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّذِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّذِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ you're killing a soul that has been prohibited from you to kill. So it's been next men mentioned next to associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ أَوْلَادَكُمْ Do not kill your children. خَشْيَةَ إِمْلَاقِ Fear of what? Poverty. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ We're the ones who are going to provide for them. وَإِيَّاكُمْ And you guys. إِنَّ قَتْلَهُمْ Killing them. كَانَ خِطَأً كَبِيرًا It's a great sin. It's a grave, dangerous sin for one to do that. And of course, the ayah, وَإِذَا الْمَوْدَةُ سُئِلَتْ And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he was asked, أَيُّ الذَّنْبِ أَعْظَمْ What's the greatest sin? The Prophet said, أَن تَجْعَلَ لِلَّهِ نِدًّا وَهُوَ خَلَقَكَ To associate partners with Allah when he's the one who created you. ثُمَّ أَيْ After the what sin or message of Allah, he said, أَن تَقْتُلَ وَلَدَكَ To kill your child. خَشْيَةَ أَن يَطْعَمَ مَعَكَ Fear that he might eat with you. Was scared that the child might eat with you. Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in Hadith in Mughirat ibn Shu'bah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said Inna Allah harrama alaykum uquq al-ummahat Allah, he made it haram to be 
to show undutifulness towards your parents and to be disrespectful to your parents. Allah prohibited that. وَمَنْ عَنْ وَهَاتِي And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also prohibited to refuse others their due rights. Somebody's haqq you have, you're choosing not to do it for them. They've worked for you, they've done a job for you. And you said, I'll pay you your rights. And you've chosen to keep their funds and the money and you've given it to them. When the sunnah and the order of the shara is what? When somebody does a work for you, you give it to them before the sweat dries on their forehead. Before it even dries, you say, here's your money. I'll pay you for what you've done. You pay them straight away. That you don't prevent the people from their rights. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prohibited the burying of your daughters alive. The Sharia has given a lot of consideration in cultivation of girls and being dutiful towards them, more than even boys. More than even boys. Because of the fact that the Arabs believe that if you raised a girl, that she is a humiliation to the, the Quran, then the opposite than the Sunnah. That the honor and the virtue lies more in the girl than it lies in the, in the boy. <laughs> and Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in hadith Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha. Our mother Aisha, she said, Ja'atni imra'atun, a woman came to me, ma'ahab matani, she had two daughters. Tas'aluni, she was asking me for something, falam tajid indi ghayra tamratin wahidatin. She was begging, she was asking for something to eat. I had nothing with me, Aisha said, except one date. Imagine, Allahu Akbar, the house of the Prophet only has one date inside it after being asked. She said, she, go, she went and she got one date. And, فَأَعْطَيْتُهَا فَقَسَمَتْهَا بَيْنَ إِبْنَتَيْهَا I got the date and I gave it to her. She took the date and she broke it into half. She gave it to her two daughters that she had. A mother, she didn't take one. Split it in half, she gave one to one daughter, and she gave the other one to the other. ثُمَّ قَامَتْ فَخَرَجَتْ She stood up and she left. فَدَخَلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ The Prophet entered. فَحَدَّثْتُهُ I told him what took place. فَقَالَ Then the Prophet said to her, مَنْ يَلِي مِنْ هَذِهِ الْبَنَاتِ Whoever is in charge of these girls and endures the test that comes from it, فَأَحْسَنَ إِلَيْهِنَّ And treats them generously. Then they will be a shield for him the day of judgment from the hellfire. These girls will be a shield from you entering the hellfire the day of judgment. <coughs> if you today ponder and you look at many girls who go to wrong relationship, boyfriend and, and, and haram, if you research and you observe their situation and you look, you realize <coughs> they've gone through this because of the fact they didn't have no fatherly love. Ponder and look at this. They didn't have no fatherly love. So a, gay, a guy came, he showed her a lot of love, he bought her a little gift here and there, and she fell for him. She's never seen this before. When she comes home, everybody's mocking her. You're fat. You need to lose weight. What are you eating? Let me guess, you're going to stay next to the fridge. We should lock the fridge from you. All of these jokes that brothers do. Ya yeah, it's not funny, wallahi. Wallahi has led to so much problems. You guys are laughing, but it's not a laughing matter. That girl meets a guy who says, you are slim. Allahu Akbar, you're in shape. I've never seen anyone like you. Ajeeb, Allahu Akbar. You're the best, you're the best. They don't say Allahu Akbar. But... <laughs> What happens? What happens to her? Because she's never heard this before. But if her father was to say to her, Princess, Daddy, what do you want? What can I do for you? He showed her love and he admired her. When a guy comes and says to her, Princess, she will look at the guy and say, that's what my dad says. Are you with me? My father shows a lot of love to me. My father cares for me. And this is why many young girls are yearning for attention outside then because they're not finding it in their own households. This is why the, if you look at the Nusus, if you look at the Kitab and the Sunni, it's a solution for problems. It's a solution for what? Problems. 
and it solves issues that we're, we're going through. The Prophet ﷺ said, these girls are shield for you for the day of judgment. He, a father who doesn't care about his daughter, whether she's in the house, whether she's gone, whether... And some cases, some cases, or messy emails I've received, girls who are abused by their own fathers, sexually abused by their own fathers, what would they stand in front of Allah the day of judgment? The girl, he, he, it was upon his, it was his, on his shoulders to take care of her, to care for her, to look after her, to observe her needs, what she wants. He chose to do this. She's going to not be a shield for him the day of judgment. She's going to take him to the hellfire. She's going to what? And these are waqai'i, realities that are taking place in our neighbors, in our local communities. It's a reality. A father who's taking his daughter and he's placing her where he wants, not knowing what she's up to, what her health is, what her needs are, not finding out, this is a problem. Wallahi, it's a problem. These girls need to be looked after. And wallahi, one thing we need to remember is, as the poet said, If you tie a person from the back like this, and you grab them, and you throw them into the water, and then you say, hey, be careful, don't let the water touch you. Is that possible? This society and practicing is like that. The parents who brought their children here and who brought their kids here or had children here, made, impregnated their wives, brought their kids here, they are like that. When you tell your child, be a practicing Muslim, it's contradicting. Unless you're making an Islamic environment. Unless you're making that environment Islamic. From the household to where they're going. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Right now, you all are aware of what Sted, uh, Ofsted have said, right? Re regarding schools. They said that young girls are going to be asked why they're wearing hijabs. Young girls. Four, five, six, seven, they're going to be asked. Why are you wearing a hijab? Father never ever sat with her. Never told her what the ruling of hijab is, or why, or what she's wearing, or what she chose to wear. And explain it to his daughter. Teach her, educate her, bring her heart to this. He hasn't done any of that. He slapped it on her head and said, go wear the hijab. Huh? She goes to school, she's like, oh, he just tells me if I don't wear it, then I'm going to go to the nar. And the fell fire looks like this. And Are you with me, brothers? Then don't be shocked when, when these things happen to you. Are you with me? One of the th things that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Ham mentions in his kitab, Thalathatul Usul was what? Ma'rifatul Islami. Bil adillah, knowing your religion with what? Evidences. From the tarbiyah of the father is what? You know the ayah when Allah says, Ya illadina amunu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. You know what some of the mufassirin say? Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. They said, bi ta'alimi hinna, by teaching them. Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save your children from the hellfire. It means bi ta'alimi hinna, by educating them, by doing ta'alim. Binti, this is my son, this is what it is. Some people's tarbiyah is only what? What's their tarbiyah? Have you eaten it? Have you had your breakfast? Have you brushed your teeth? Have you washed, have you washed, washed your mouth? Go to sleep? Have you put your pajamas on? Their tarbiyah is all that. That's what it is. What the child eats, if the child sleeps, that's it. Not even mentally building the child. And one of the things that Imam al Izm al Abdul Salam, when he speaks about in his kitab, Al Qawaid al Kubra, he mentions in there that one of the rights that the community have on you is that you cultivate your children correctly. This is a right that we have in you. Because it's your child, you have not cultivated properly, you've not nurtured him properly, who's going to rob my house. And he's going to be a harm to my children. It's a communal obligation. They need, the community need you to take care of your child. And make sure that your child is good and, and is not a, a criminal. So make sure that your household, again, from the things that I, just recently, I, I know a brother, a very close brother, whose children have been taken from him, social service. Come on, bring your children. If today somebody took your children for you, what do you live for? Eight, seven year old child that you've been raising, you've been giving food, you've been giving everything, turn them over. Two, son and a daughter. Seven and eight and nine kids, that roughly that age. Kids have been taken. Khalas. Finished, it's over with you. 
Why? Because his daughter said that forces me to wear hijab. Forces me. Now I, I ask questions. I always ask questions because I know everything has a problem. So number one is what do you have in your house? Television. Hmm. MashaAllah. Ajeeb. Your child is watching. You look at the kids today. You watch the kids today. As soon as you look at them, they're like, oh, don't even think about touching me, dad. Social services. Where did they get that from? This is not revelation that came to them, right? Are you with me? Where are they learning all of this? Where are they getting all of this from? It's all because your child is more plugged in the program than you are. He's got internet, you bought him a nice iPhone, he goes through his iPhone, he knows all the latest updates and new things that are happening, he's got a 50 inch plasma television you bought to him in the house, he knows, he goes to a state school and he's talking to this and he's talking to that, he knows everything. I have a family relative, he's 12 years old, umruhu 12 years of age, he's in a gang, he's got a girlfriend, he's got a phone, He's got, he's needed, and the police in the whole locality know him. 12 years of age. He's 12 brothers. I went the other day to speak to him. He said, bro, I'm going to press charges against you. He's 12. What are you going to do? Press charges. I said, I'll leave you alone, inshallah. 12 years of age. Are you with me, brothers? Where's the parents? Where's the tarbiyah? Are you with me? This is a big problem in the community. Wallah, it's a big problem. And we need to wake up. I'm going to conclude there, inshaAllah ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu